organize indicate the how we do let out by the what we do of the strategy but the relevance between organizing structures and strategy is another story for later time well in short we can conclude that organize in management term means the deployment of organization resources to achieve a strategic goals how about vertical structure looking for us we have had a brief outlook about this type of structure in chapter one right so let me have a quick reminder first about this structure category we call a structure that is vertical where it has these basic characteristics it has multiple levels in the hierarchy from top middle to first line manager and level controlling runs from top to bottom which means that decision making falls in the hand of superior managers and finally a level of approval runs from bottom to top which means work goes to middle and then to top manager to be approved so we have had an outside out, inside out understanding about the connotation of organized and vertical structure which will together contribute to the first section of today's lesson. Let's get into the first section of chapter 10, which is organizing the vertical structure. Well, how can a manager organize a vertical structure of an organization? To answer this question, an organization in general or a manager in specific must conduct or fulfill these two main actions conducting work specialization and creating a chain of command what is work specialization work specialization or in a more intimate term division of labor or vietnamese phân công lao động refers to the degree which organization divides the task of every member of it into several jobs remember when i said organize is to do what we have to do so as to achieve our initial goal. So consider the big thing of an organization which have to be done in order to achieve its strategic goal is the complete job that cannot be deciphered only by one member of a company. By breaking that big thing into smaller and more precise job that employee can complete, we can make the fit which is solving the complete job feasible. Let's talk, take a small branch of KFC and Google, for example. In terms of sales service and production development, we see that KFC divides those into customer service, which are the cashier to whom you order your meal and food service. In this case, the people repairing your meal in the kitchen. While in Google, sales operation, engineering and design team members are in charge of these two aspects respectively so regardless of being in a small or large environment of any organization work specialization exists it helps the organization to complete tasks faster and more efficient by specializing the employees to do the suitable tasks that they are more expertise in all right so all of those are for work specialization let's look into the chain of command what's the chain of command and how does the current power flow inside an organization chain of command is the system that determines who report to whom which means that each member has the obligation to report to their superior and also has a senior responsibility to their subordinates at the top of that hierarchy is the CEO and the owner of the organization and the people that report to them should appear right below. Now, to understand how orders are transmitted in an organization, we must find out what is authority, what is delegation, this policy, stability, and accountability. Okay. Authority is demonstrated through three of these characteristics. Authority is vetted in an organization position. This means managers had authority because of the position they hold, not who they are. Authority is accepted by subordinate. 
which is Polynesian comply your authority because they accept your order. Authority flow down the vertical hierarchy. The higher the position you have, the more power and responsibility you get. How about delegation? Delegation is the transfer of authority and responsibility towards lower position in the authority hierarchy. In basic, delegation is the act of instructing tasks to subordinate to complete it. The responsibility is very familiar with third right. How about responsibility? Responsibility, in short, refer to the duty to do the task that has been assigned. And final is accountability. By definition, management defines that accountability as a mechanism through which authority and responsibility are brought into alignment. Okay, so they obviously abstract, right? So I have a look accountability on the internet and I see that people sometimes mistake responsibility and accountability are the same since in Vietnamese they both mean trách nhiệm. Uh, so how can we differentiate accountability from responsibility? Given an example relating to doing housework. In the first scenario you are living alone. The demand for hygiene involves you to doing chores. In this case, you can decide whether to do the housework because there's no authority forces you to do that except for your own sake. The decide to do housework for yourself is called responsibility. In the second scenario, you are living with your family. The parent have you do the housework. So you are signed with informing your mom and dad that you have completed doing homework, uh, housework after doing it. In this case, you face an authority, which is your parent and consequences for not doing the housework or doing it badly. So the willingness of you to be responsible for the housework after doing it and take account to your parent, which is an authority in this case, is called accountability. So Tangentially, authority, responsibility, accountability, and delegation together, they are the four cogwheels that contribute to operate a system of power as a whole, which is called the chain of command. Another piece of information they, that needs to be noted according to the chain of command is the division of authority into two sub -channel. They are line authority and staff authority. Line authority is the more noticeable kind of authority in an organization. It reflects the relationship between superior and subordinate in decision making, which flows down in the hierarchy of power. So in short, line authority is the string that connects the chain of command in a vertical structure based organization, reflected to line department, which perform fundamental tasks such as sales or production of an organization. The second genre is staff authority. While staff authority appears quite a lot in medium and large organization, it can be easily forgotten. Staff authority plays an advisory role on complementing line authority. Staff department undertakes the staff authority's function. This personnel cannot be involved in the decision making of a company. Instead, staff department is more like a consultant to line department. So imagine you are a sales manager. You have an associate who is a court accountant. He provides you information about which product have the highest profit or the most valuable products to sell. In this case, the man plays a part of staff authority. Okay, so until now, the first segment of chapter 10 by far has been a bit lengthy, I suppose. To blow you with a new fresh air, we invite you to take your step into the second part of chapter 10, which is new management of self-test authority role models presented by Kat Link. So hi guys, my name is Link and I'll be responsible for the second part of our team today lecture which is new management self-test authority role model.
My presentation consists of two contents. The first one is span of management and the second one is centralization and decentralization. First, we'll start with the definition of span of management. So span of management, or sometimes called span of control, is the number of employees reporting to a supervisor. For example, looking at this graph, we can see that the span of management for the director equals three, which are finance manager, sales manager, and marketing manager. In addition, this characteristic of structure determines how closely a supervisor can monitor subordinates. Traditional views of organization design recommended a span of management of about seven to ten subordinates per manager. However, many lean organizations today have spans of management as high as 30, 40, and even higher. An example here is the company named Gamesa. Teams are so productive and efficient that Gamesa factories operate with around 56 subordinates per manager. Next is the list describe the factors that are associated with less supervisor involvement and thus larger spans of control. I'll read it slowly so that you guys can have more time to take note. First, work performed by subordinates is stable and routine. Second, subordinates perform similar work tasks. Third, subordinates are concentrated in single location. Fourth, subordinates are highly trained and need little direction in performing tasks. Fifth, rules and procedures defining task activities are available. Sixth, little time is required in non-supervisory activities, such as coordination with other departments or planning. Seventh, manager personal preference and size favor a large span. And the last one, support system and personnel are available for the manager. The span of management or span of control is divided into two types of structure. And we use the average span of control to determine whether the structure is tall or flat. A tall structure has an overall narrow span and more hierarchical levels, as you can see in the picture here. In the old time, having too many hierarchical levels and narrow span of control is a common structural problem for organization. The result may be that routine decisions are made too high in the organization, which pulls higher level executive away from important long-range strategic issues and limit the creativity, innovativeness, and accountability of lower level managers. While a flat structure has a wide span, is horizontally dispersed and has fewer hierarchical levels. Moreover, the trend in recent years has been toward wider span of control as a way to facilitate relegation. Just because the nowadays trend is flat structure doesn't mean all managers should use the flat one. Remember that different structures will fit different situations. So I'll make it clearer by giving an example. A CEO who must spend a lot of time interacting directly with customer, partners, or regulator as part of his or her job will need a narrower span of control, allocating more responsibility to direct reports and freeing up more time for external activities. Whereas a CEO involved in a major internal transformation may need a wider span of control to stay on top of what is happening all across the organization. So that is the end of the first part. Moving to the second one, it is about centralization and decentralization. Centralization and decentralization pertain to the hierarchical level at which decisions are made. Centralization means that decision authority is located near the top of the organization. Example, like McDonald's, use centralization to get a standardized menu everywhere. Or a common example is Apple computers. 
where most of the direction of the company is orchestrated at the very top, formerly Steve Jobs himself, which the lower levels of management and employees very tightly organized to execute those roles. By contrast, regarding decentralization, decision authority is pushed downward to lower organization levels. An example of a decentralized organization is Johnson & Johnson, which is well known for its consumer business of baby products. I think like all of us in here, especially girls, use it a lot when we were babies. And to be honest, when I was young, I was also a big fan of Johnson. With more than 130 employees worldwide, Johnson & Johnson has long been known as a decentralized company. Johnson & Johnson has chosen local management to run its company for a few reasons. They understand the customer better. They understand the people they are directly working with. They understand the government and marketplace need. If they make mistake, it won't cripple the whole organization. To sum up, organization may have to experiment to find the correct hierarchical level at which to make decision and manager should diagnose the organizational situation and select the decision making level that will best meet the organization's need. All right, then, so for the last part of my presentation, there are three factors that typically influence centralization versus decentralization. The first item is greater change and uncertainty in the environment are usually associated with decentralization. A good example of how decentralization can help cope with rapid change and uncertainty occur following Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Mississippi Power restored power in just 12 days, thanks largely to a decentralized management system that empowered people at the electrical substations to make rapid on-the-spot decisions. And next, the second item on this list is strategic fit, which means the amount of centralization or decentralization should fit the firm's strategy. For instance, Google tried for years with a decentralized approach that allowed creative people to go in their own direction and run their areas as they saw fit. Decentralization fits with the strategy of allowing creative people to innovate and respond quickly to consumer needs. As the company grew large, however, it began to lose its focus with the free willing approach Larry Page has brought centralization to Google to fit the strategy of being more consistent and competitive in the post-PC area. Page killed off dozens of non-essential or unsuccessful projects and reorganized the company to focus on their key product areas and give top executives more accountability and responsibility for results. So yeah, this is the really last one. In time of crisis or risk of company failure, authority may be centralized at the top. Recall an example of Mr. Kwa has shown us in the previous lesson about the BP company. So BP has centralized its exploration, development, and production operations so that a single executive is in charge of the upstream operation. Previously, three executives handled the upstream unit, but BP CEO Robert Dudley believed that a strong centralized structure were needed to manage risk. So thank you everyone a lot for listening to me. For the next part, Ling and Nyati will be in charge of it. Thank you, Lynn, for your sharing. Um, now, I will continue our presentation with the next section in this chapter 10, departmentalization. So perhaps we as freshmen in college, beginners in the economic field, have never encountered this word. 
But if I use another way to explain this, you can see this definition is omnipresent in our daily lives. When it comes to applying to clubs, people would give you a booklet of their departments. And after reading the description and a long period of consideration, you would decide which one to apply to. In clubs, some departments would be human resources, marketing or media department, and finance department. In organizations, people at some more technical departments, namely production department and research and development department. This procedure of realizing and categorizing activities and human capital into units is named departmentalization or departmentation. Departmentalization means dividing an organization into different departments, which each typically perform specialized tasks. The basic need for departmentalization is to make the size of each departmental unit manageable and secure the advantages of specialization. It also provides a basis on which the top managers can coordinate and control the activities of the departmental units. There are many different types of departmentation, but I can list some of the popular, which are functional departmentalization, customer departmentalization, product departmentalization, or geographic departmentalization, and so on. But today, we will not delve into any of the aforementioned types of departmentalization. Instead, we would like to introduce and clarify five distinguished approaches to departmentalization, all of which are categorized into two groups, three traditional approaches and two innovative approaches, respectively. So, ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you three traditional approaches to departmentalization. First, we have vertical functional approach or U-form structure, aka unitary structure. Right from the name, you can already tell that this approach is basically a strategy where activities are grouped together by common function from the bottom to the top of the organization. And it is an example of centralization. It uses a hierarchical structure with a strong concept of subordination. Employees are managed through clear lines of authority and they ultimately report to one person. People, facilities, and other resources representing a common function are grouped into a single department. Positions are categorized based on similar skills, expertise, work activities, and resource use. As illustrated in the figure, some departments can be accounting, which handles financial issue for the entire company, or human resources department responsible for recruitment process and every human related positions. Information flows up and down the vertical hierarchy and the chain of command converges at the top of the organization. Also, rules and procedures govern the duties and responsibilities of each employee and employees at lower hierarchical levels accept the right of those higher in the hierarchy to make decisions and issue orders. Those are the basic characteristics of vertical functional structure. Now I will analyze its strengths along with its attached drawbacks. First off, grouping employees by common tasks permits economies of skill and efficient resource use. Why so? because these specialized units contain personnel with related skills grouped by similarities and they handle one aspect of the product or service provided. Secondly, since the functional organization structure clusters those with similar knowledge in the same place, employees grow within their fields, leading to the development of specialists, especially in technical fields. Businesses using functional structure will find it easy to promote within as employees are coached and move up in the business. The in-depth training and focused career path give employees clear career goals and the direction to reach them. It also offers a way to centralize decision making and provide a unified direction from top managers. Organizations that make the most out of this approach would be Specialized agencies of the United Nations, such as the International Civil Aviation Organization, the United Nations Children's Fund, or the World Health Organization. 
On the other hand, there are some downsides of this approach that make this structure not so relevant in this rapidly changing world compared to other approaches. Because people are separated into distinct departments, communication and coordination across functions are often poor, causing a low response to environmental changes. Another problem is that decisions involving more than one department may pile up at the top of the organization and be delayed. All in all, what we can infer from this approach is that functional organizational structure is best for smaller companies or those that focus on a single product or service. Not designed to change quickly, functional structure works well in a stable environment where your business strategies are less inclined to need changes or updating. Now, let's move on to the next one, divisional approach, which is sometimes called N-form or multi-divisional structure. The divisional structure occurs when departments are grouped together based on similar organizational outputs. And in contrast to the functional approach is a decentralized form. The divisional structure is also sometimes called a product structure, program structure, or self-contained unit structures. Like all of these basically mean the same thing. Diverse departments are brought together to produce a single organizational output, whether it is a product, a program, or service to a single customer. When a huge organization produces products for different markets, the divisional works because each division is an autonomous business. Compelling evidence for this would be Google. Google has seven product divisions, including YouTube, Jerome and Apps, Android, Knowledge, Ad Products, Geo and Commerce, and Google+. In a divisional structure, divisions are created as self-contained units with each depart separate function departments for each division. Each department is smaller than the functional approach and focuses on a single product line or customer segment. Departments are duplicated across product lines. Unlike in vertical functional approach where decisions are made at the top of the hierarchy, in this structure, differences between opinions are solved at divisional level, not by the president. That's why we say divisional approach encourages decentralization. With that being said, decision making is pushed down at least one level in the hierarchy, freeing the president and other top managers for strategic planning. Only if the divisions can't agree or fail to coordinate or start making decisions that hurt the organization are some decisions pulled back to the top. With those characteristics, this strategy is believed to secure the organization's flexibility and responsiveness to changes, since each small unit operates within its environment only. Other than that, we can also state that employees will push forward higher concern for customers' needs as they work on one sole line of product or service. The same result can also be better coordination across departments due to product, cooperation, and the common trait that they share when creating a value together. Nevertheless, much as they harmonize across departments, they rarely have any contact with other divisions of product, or at least not on a regular basis, for the fact that they operate different services within different environments. Furthermore, as mentioned before, departments are duplicated in each division, and each division may have its own research facilities. This results in duplication of resources and the high cost of running separate divisions and also tax implication. In addition, the small size of department within each division may result in lack of technical specialization, expertise, and training. In a nutshell, the divisional structure is especially useful when a company has many regions, markets, and products. It gives a larger business enterprise the ability to divide large sections of the company's business into semi-autonomous groups. However, it can cause higher total costs and can result in number of quarrels within a company. The last traditional approach that I want to share with y'all today is the matrix approach. It is perceived as a combination of 
functional and divisional approach. Like, is this possible? Is this feasible to operate vertically and horizontally at the same time? We'll see. One unique feature of the matrix is that it has dual lines of authority. In matrix approach, the functional hierarchy of the authority runs vertically, providing traditional control within functional departments. The divisional hierarchy of authorities runs horizontally, and it provides coordination across departments. The top leader is responsible for the entire matrix. The top leader oversees both the product and functional chains of command. His or her responsibility is to maintain a power balance between the two sides of the matrix. The rest boxes are called matrix bosses who are responsible for one side of the matrix. These two systems combine and create a matrix that give equal emphasis to both functional and divisional lines of authority, where employees report to two managers simultaneously, and then they are named as two boss employees. To exemplify the structure, let me bring you Starbucks. The functional hierarchy level feature of Starbucks is most pronounced at the top levels of Starbucks corporate structure, such as the corporate headquarters. The company has a human resources department, a finance department, and a marketing department. It facilitates top-down monitoring and control with the CEO at the top. Functional groups are responsible for the organization-wide development and implementation of strategies. Starbucks also utilize divisional approach in form of geographic-based division and product-based division. With geographic-based division, they divide it into three regional divisions for the global market. One, America. Two, China and Asia Pacific. Three, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And with the product base, Starbucks has product-based divisions in its organizational structure to address product lines. For example, the company has a division for coffee and related products, another division for baked goods, and another division for merchandise like mugs. This is how a matrix structure operates. And if it is welcomed by such a huge company like Starbucks, what are its merits? The matrix can be highly effective in a complex, rapidly changing environment in which the organization needs to be flexible, innovative, and adaptable. The matrix structure combines the project management structure with the functional management structure to increase efficiency, adapt to changing market, and respond more quickly to market demand. Secondly, by allowing different departments to work together, the matrix structure fosters a more open work environment, ultimately making the organization more dynamic. As a result, the conflict and frequent meetings generated by the matrix allow new issues to be raised and resolved. The matrix structure makes efficient use of human resources because specialists can be transferred from one division to another. Conversely, nothing is perfect. One common disadvantage of matrix structure can appear as confusion between managers who are involved with the projects that are outlined by the matrix. Since the power dynamics between the functional manager and the project manager may not be as clearly defined within the matrix, confusion about the specific managerial roles may arise. The matrix structure also can generate a high level of conflict because functional and divisional approach head to different ways. Rivalry between the two sides of the matrix can be exceedingly difficult for two boss employees to manage, and this leads to time lost to meetings and discussions devoted to resolve these conflicts. All things considered, this template is widely embraced by big companies and corporations, so perhaps its advantages far outweigh its disadvantages, and a company should choose a matrix structure when it wants to promote innovation and speed up new product development process. Now, I will pass the stage to Nyakhi, and he will continue the presentation with innovative organizational approaches. So, I will continue learning from here, and together, let us explore the two innovative departmentalization. On to the first one, 
So what is team-based approach? In short, team-based approach means the organization creates a series of teams to accomplish specific tasks and to coordinate major departments. Teams can exist from the office of the president all the way down to the shop floor. The team approach is probably the most widespread trend in departmentalization. The vertical chain of command is a powerful means of control, but passing all the decisions up the hierarchy takes too long and keeps responsibility at the top. That is why team-based approach allows managers to delegate authority, push responsibility to lower levels, and be more flexible and responsive in the competitive global environment. So, here how it works. There are two ways to think about using teams in organizations, permanent teams and cross-functional teams. Permanent teams are a group of employees brought together as a formal department. Emphasis is on horizontal communication and information sharing because representatives from all functions coordinate to complete a specific task. Authority is pushed down to lower levels, and frontline employees are given the freedom to make decisions and act on their own. In this form, team members may share or rotate leadership. Cross-functional teams consist of employees from various functional departments, responsible to meet as a team and resolve mutual problems. Team members report to their functional departments, but also to the team. A frequent use of cross-functional team is for chain projects, such as a new product. Now, we take Apple as an example. Apple steps away from the traditional autocratic leadership model and gives every team member the freedom to support ideas, contest opinions, and eventually build on each other's thinking to come up with the best solution. Like Jason, the wireless software engineering manager at Apple has said, to see all the cross-functional work and the relationships we have forged come together in one product makes me incredibly proud. Apple is all about the user experience, even in ways consumers may not observe. This team is responsible to keep things going as finished products move through their supply chain and sales channels. Apple employed a cross-functional team to create the revolutionary iPhone they brought together experts from different departments across the business to start what was to become a smartphone revolution. They worked cross-functionally with other Apple teams to discover ways to enhance process, such as making simple for consumers to order a product online and pick it up in a store. They are considered as one of the greatest teams of all time bringing about innovation. Today, it is renowned globally for its innovations in hardware, software, and services. Apple has grown from roughly 8,000 workers and $7 billion in revenue in 1997, the year Steve Jobs returns to nearly 240,000 employees and almost $275 billion in revenue in 2020. The main reasons behind Apple's massive success are its organizational culture that supports cross-functional collaboration and the associate leadership model. The reason why team approach method works so well is because it has better communication. The primary advantage of a team-based organization is that because there are usually no managers, only one manager supervising multiple teams, communication between employees is much more free-flowing and effective. Team-based organizations lack the multiple layers that employees would otherwise have to go through before suggesting or receiving the go-ahead to implement a new idea. Second is that teams resolve problems quicker. This improved communication also means that companies can resolve work issues quicker because employees can share information at a faster rate, which speeds up responsiveness. Third is flexible and empower workforce. Another advantage is that team-based organizations are more flexible than organizations that are traditionally structured. As a, business, as a business owner, you can shift employees from one team to another to maximize their skills. 
and talent and to also keep them motivated with new challenges. Employees that work in teams are also more likely to understand their specific roles in the organization and are also more likely to feel validated and empowered. Although it is a splendid method on how to run organizations, there are still some downside to it. There are potential for conflict. This is usually the major disadvantage of a team-based organization is that personality conflicts within the team because it can negatively impact efficiency and group harmony. Although managers have the options of moving one employee out of the team to preserve unity, the disruptive employee would have to fit well with another team, which can be a challenge. Some people are not team players and underperforming employees hide behind the team. What I meant to say is that not all employees are suited to teamwork. Some employees work more efficiently on their own and being part of a group may not maximize their skill set. And another drawback is that some employees in a team setting may rely on other employees to make up for their own lack of effort. In other words, some employees may call on the efforts of other employees, which may require managers to implement individual performance milestone to ensure that each member of the team is putting forth the same effort. Finally, is that time and resources spent on meetings and too much decentralization that makes the members lose the big firm's picture. Now we will move on to the second one, which is virtual network approach. As you can see, the organization becomes a small central hub electronically connected to other organizations that perform vital functions. Departments are independent, contracting services to the central hub for profit, and departments can be located anywhere in the world. This is the most recent approach to departmentalization, extends the idea of horizontal coordination beyond the boundaries of the organization. The most widespread design trend in recent years has been the outsourcing of various parts of the organization to outside partners. Outsourcing means to contract out certain tasks or functions such as manufacturing, human resources, or credit processing to other companies. Partnerships and alliance and other collaborative forms are now a leading approach to accomplishing strategic goals. Some organizations take this networking approach to the extreme to create a new kind of structure. So the virtual network organizations may be viewed as a central hub surrounded by a network of outside specialists. With a network structure, rather than being housed under one roof or located within one organization, services such as accounting, design, manufacturing, marketing, and distribution are outsourced to separate companies or individuals that are connected electronically to a central office. Example, as you can see in the picture, a company will have their business partners finish each task, like the design provided in Canada, transportation provided in Korea, manufacturing provided in Asia, distribution provided in Europe, and accounts receivable provided in the United States. Organizational partners located in different parts of the world may use network computers or the internet to exchange data and information so rapidly and smoothly that a loosely connected network of suppliers, manufacturers, and distributors can look and act like one seamless company. The virtual network form incorporates a free market style to replace the traditional vertical hierarchy. Subcontractors may flow into and out of the system as needed to meet changing needs. When a business chooses to use a network structure, the hub maintains control over processes in which it has world-class or difficult to imitate capabilities and then transfer other work activities along with the control over them to other organizations. These partner organizations organize and accomplish their work using their own ideas and tools. The idea is that a firm can concentrate on what it does best and contract out everything else to companies with 
distinctive competence in those specific areas, enabling the organization, the organization to do more with less. As you can see, Nike was a pioneer in using the virtual network structure, so much that the widespread trend toward network structure has been referred to as Nikeification. Executives at Nike were quick to realize that design and marketing provided their company's competitive advantage. So they kept these tasks in-house and formed a network of partners to handle other functions such as manufacturing. The company founder, Phil Knight, came up with the idea of outsourcing manufacturing jobs to cut costs, becoming an early adopter of the virtual organization design Propel Nike into one of the biggest athletic footwear and apparel companies in the world. Now we will move on to the advantages of the virtual network approach. Like I have said, the biggest advantage is it enables even small organizations to obtain talents and resources worldwide. Also gives a company immediate scale and reach without huge investments in factories, equipment, or distribution facilities. The structure is the leanest of all because little supervision is required. There may only be two or three levels of hierarchy compared with 10 or more in traditional firms. This method also reduced administrative overhead costs. The disadvantages is the lack of hand-on control. Managers do not have hands-on control over many activities and employees, so there will be a risk of organizational failure if a partner fails to deliver or goes out of business. The weak and ambitious boundaries also creates higher uncertainty and greater demands on manager for defining shared goals, coordinating activities, managing relationships, and keeping people focused. Also, employees' loyalty can weaken. Employees may feel that they can be replaced anytime by contract services. So that concludes our presentations on departmentalization. Now we'll move on with Gate on organizing for horizontal coordination. Uh, thank you, He and Ling, for your sharing. Now we'll continue our presentation with section four, organizing for horizontal coordinations. One reason for the growing use of teams and networks is that many managers recognize the limit of traditional vertical organization structure in a fast shifting environment. In general, the trend is toward breaking down barriers between departments and many companies are moving toward horizontal structure based on work processes rather than departmental functions. However, regardless of the type of structure, every organization needs mechanisms for horizontal integrations and coordinations. The structure of an organization is not complete without designing the horizontal as well as the vertical dimension of structure. Here is the outline. And now we're gonna toward the first part, the need for coordinations. As organizations grow and evolve, two things gonna happen. First, new positions and departments are at to deal with factors in the external environment or with new strategic needs as, as described earlier in the chapter. As companies add positions and departments to meet changing needs, they grow more complex with hundreds of positions and departments performing incredibly diverse activities. Second, senior managers have to find a way to tie all these departments together. The formal change of command and the supervisions is provided is effective, but not enough. These two things lead to several problems like lack of solidarity, low efficiencies, limit utilization of resources, and so on. How can we solve this problem? There are two solutions. The first one is coordination. It refers to the managerial task of adjusting and synchronizing the diverse activities among different individuals and departments. The second one, collaborations. It means a joint effort between people from two or more departments to produce outcomes that meet a common goal or shared purpose, and that are typically greater than what any of the individuals or departments could achieve working alone. So to give you guys a closer look on how coordinations and collaboration happen in real life, I'm gonna show you two examples. The first one is state for coordination. It's about Microsoft. 
Microsoft is having a hard time keeping pace with Apple and Google. One big reason is that the company divisions have long been at war with one another. Stephen A. Palmer, longtime CEO of Microsoft, recently said, to execute, we got to move from multiple Microsoft to one Microsoft. Palmer and other top executives are implementing a major reorganization that is solved the existing a product division in favor of four units beyond broad terms that the leadership hope will encourage greater collaboration and teamwork. The goal, said Palmer, is to organize things so as to drive across company team for success. Whereas if each division once had its own finance and marketing departments, the function had been centralized through force group to work more closely together to create complete products where all the hardware, software, and service work together. In a telephone interview, Kilu, the head of Bing and Microsoft other internet initiatives, said the old structure was similar to baseball in that it gave individual player opportunity to perform. A better model for the new Microsoft, he says, is football. You have to huddle before every play. So that's how coordination looks like. Now we're going to move to the second example that's stay for collaborations. To understand the value of collaborations, consider the 2011 U.S. mission to raid Osama bin Laden's compound in Pakistan. The raid could not have succeeded without close collaborations between the Central Inter Intelligence Agency, mean CIAs, and the U.S. military. There had traditionally been little interaction between them, but the war on terrorism has changed that mindset. During planning for the bin Laden missions, Military officers spend every day for months working closely with the CIA team in a remote, secure facility on the CIA campus. On and on, collaborations and coordinations within business organizations is just as important. Without coordinations, a company left hand will not act in a connect with the right one, causing problems and conflicts. Coordination is required regardless of whether the organizations had a functional, divisional, or team structure. The picture the picture on the slide is illustrating the, organ the evolutions of organizational structure with a growing emphasis on the horizontal coordinations. Although the vertical functional structure is effective in stable environments, it does not provide a horizontal coordination that is, that is needed in times of rapid change. Innovations such as cross-functional teams, task force, and project managers work within the vertical structure but provide a means to increase horizontal communications and cooperations. The next stage evolve re-engineering to structure the organizations into teams working on horizontal processes. Re-engineering refers to the radical redesign of business processes to achieve dramatic improvements in cost, quality, service, and speed. Because the focus of re-engineering is on horizontal workflows, Rather than functions, re-engineering generally leads to a shift away from strong vertical structure to one emphasizing stronger horizontal coordinations. The vertical hierarchy is flattened, with perhaps only a few senior executives in traditional support functions such as finance and HR. So that's our first part. I will continue our presentation with the second one, task force, teams, and project management. So the first one, what is a task force? A task force is a temporary team or committee designed to solve a problem involving several departments. Task force members represent their departments and share information that enable coordination. One example for a task force is that after Super Typhoon Haiyang struck the Philippines in November 2013, leaving thousands dead and nearly half a million homeless, various branches of the U.S. military created a task force to have the rescue effort. Made up of members of the U.S. Marine, Navy, State Department, and other agencies, joined task force 205 brought food, water, and other organically needed relief supply to the regions. And the second one, cross-functional teams. A cross-functional team further horizontal coordinations because participants from several departments meet regularly to solve ongoing problems of common interest. This team is similar to a task force, except that it's work with continuing rather than temporary problems and might exist for several years. The third one, project management. A project manager is a person who is responsible for coordinating the activities of several departments for the completions of a specific project. The distinctive feature of the project manager's position is that the person is not a member of one of the departments being coordinated. 
coordinated. To give you guys a closer look on how a project management project manager look like in a hierarchy, here an example of the project manager relationship to other departments. In some organizations, project managers are included on the organization chart. As illustrated in the picture, the project manager is drawn to one side of the chart to indicate authority over the project, but not over the people who are assigned to it. The dashed line to the project managers indicate responsibility for, for coordination and communication with assigned team members, but department manager retain line authority over functional employees. And our last part, relational coordinations. Relational coordination is the highest level of horizontal coordination, which refers to frequent, timely, problem-solving communications carried out through employee relationship of shared goals, shared knowledge, and mutual respect. Relational coordination is in a structural device or mechanism such as project manager, but rather is part of the very fabric and culture of the organizations. In an organization with a high level of relational coordination, People share information freely across department boundaries, and people interact on a continuous basis to share knowledge and solve problems. Michael Bayerlin, Kyoto University professor, said that, of, <laughs> said that management makes the assumption that, that after it comes your team, you are a team, but in fact, collaborations require leadership commitment, resources, training, and constant reinforcements. Uh, it's my mistake. We're going to move to the previous line at, about a relational coordination. So, as you can see, coordination is carried out through a web of ongoing positive relationships rather than, rather than because of formal coordination roles or mechanisms. Employees coordinate directly with, with each other across units. The desire for relational coordination is reflected in the changing physical environment of many today office. Rather than having people separated into cubicles, companies are using open office with quite a desire for conversations and impromptu problem solving. Uh, the picture on the left is showing one of the most common office nowadays. It's including the hood, the hood room, also the planning room. Um, study also have shown that having people work in close proximity, proximity to one another does increase collaboration. However, changing the physical environment isn't enough to be relational coordination into the fabric of the organizations. Managers invest in training people in the skill needed to interact with one another and resolve cross departmental conflicts based on shared goals rather than emphasizing goals of their separate departments. Give you guys, to give you guys an example of relational coordinations, I'm going to show a case of Southwest Airlines. Airlines face many challenges, but one they have faced hundreds of times on a daily basis is getting airplanes loaded and off the ground safely and on time. Flight departure is a highly complex process. It involves numerous employees from various departments, such as ticket agents, pilots, flight attendants, purchase handlers, gate agents, and so forth. Performing multiple tasks within a limited time period under uncertain and ever-changing conditions. If all these groups are entirely coordinated, a successful on-time departure is difficult to achieve. Southwest Airline has a sorted turnaround time in the, in the business, partly because managers promote relational coordination to achieve super, superior on-time performance and a high level of customer satisfaction. In any airline, there can be serious disagreement among employees about who is to blame when a flight is delayed. So Southwest managers created what they call team delay. Rather than searching for who is to blame when something goes wrong, the team delay is due to point out problems in coordination between various groups. The emphasis on the team focus everyone on their shared goal of on-time departure, accurate purchase handling, and customer satisfaction. Because delay becomes a team problem, People are motivated to work closely together and coordinate their activities rather than looking out for themselves and trying to avoid or see blame. Supervisors work closely with employees, but their role is less being the boss, as it is facilitating learning and helping people do their job. Southwest use a, more, a small supervisory span of control, about one supervisor for every eight or nine frontline employees so that supervisors have the time to coach and assist employees 
who are viewed as internal customer. So that is that is my sections. Now we're gonna move to the last section with Dan Ngoc Long. Well, we've met again in the final section of chapter 10. Okay, remember earlier when I mentioned about the relevance between a structure and strategy at the beginning of the presentation. Now we may have a closer look into how can strategy affect on an organization structure and besides strategy, what else can have an impact on shaping an organization structure? Let's get into factor that shaping structure. Nowadays, there's no concept that identifies any structures at the best. Each organization erects its own structure that pays the more convenient role to its objective. We see that each organization's structure must fit into the check of one of these two factors in order to be optimized, that is strategy and technology. So in strategy, soon I have defined, organized in the how we do, let out with the what we do of strategy, since structure is a system to which we organize in order to meet the strategy presented. Manager have longly defined structure and strategy as horses for courses. We've been learning about numerous kind of organization model which is structure varying from vertical, horizontal to functional and divisional structure and it has a unique adaptability to a particular circumstances which is initially aimed by strategy. For example, an organization which aims to customer value should choose a structure that is flexible in terms of decision making and innovation such as horizontal structure. On the other hand, an organization which emphasizes on productivity and specialization should implement the vertical and functional view to the structure. Another characteristic that affects an organization's structure is technology. As Woodward, a pioneer who was the first to establish the link between organization structure and technology, stated, the relationship between structure and performance surfaced only by introducing an extra variable, that is technology. So, Woodward conducted a research into 100 manufacturers ranging from small scale to large scale production. She realized that despite each manufacturer specialized in their particular aspect, most of these companies have identical patterns in the organization structure and can be mainly classified as three technology levels. First is unit-based level. Unit base is the type of structure that produces a small unit of goods and services designed to customer specification, require high skilled workers, small pen of management. As an example of this, we can mention theory. Why there are many very few of these cars that are produced each year, each car had gone through a highly professional procedure and had been a fruition of master craftsmanship and dedication who, of those who made it. On the other hand, mass Bay produces large quantity of product. Low skill worker and long span of management is required in this type of structure. An example for this is Toyota and Ford. Ford with M2, a broader segmentation of customers which varies from low end to luxury products. Final is continued process, is the type of structure that involves entire workflow and non stop production. We can see this type of structure in pharmaceutical industry since a production of a drug must be a continuing process from printing it to consuming it since these substances are easily reacted to chemical reaction. The difference between technology imposed on these three structures is called technical complexity. So by all and large, what was survey 
has proved that technology condition of an organization can comprehensively shape the way of how a structure of an organization is organized. We can conclude that there are two main criteria that contribute in the process of shaping an organization structure by acquiring a specific strategy and suitable technology into a structure the company can operate as expected. Oh, that's quite too much for a chapter, right? This next is a brief conclusion of what we've learned in chapter 10. You may take a screenshot of this slide, which I suppose will help you a lot in the following game. So I will give you 10 seconds if you want to take a screenshot of this slide, okay? Okay, so let's uh, sum up what we've been learning in a game, which we call uh, Rescue Jimmy. We'll give you 15 numbers representing 15 questions in which there will be two special presents. The present will be given for the lucky team when we study applied. Okay, so each question will be validated by a respective keyword. Let's divide our class into nine teams, like your project group. You guys will participate in this game in order from team one to team nine. After having answered a question, the last seven questions, we will choose the team who raised their hand the fastest. The team which can answer the most question will be given participation point. And uh, Mr. Choir, can we ask you to train the team with the highest score of uh, each member of that team, a participant, Mark. Yes, uh, I agree with you. Yeah, so um, all the rules and criteria has been um, approved. Okay, so let's begin. Um, first is team one. Can you choose a number? Seven, please. Yeah, uh, let's get to number seven question. So the question is one unique feature of the matches that it has blank of the authority. This word contains two words. So you remember the criteria that is mis usually misinterpreted as responsibility in chapter one that I have mentioned. Yeah, that is the hint. Okay. Please don't let you answer this. Uh, is that your lies? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. You got it. Okay, so I don't let you, you are from which team? Uh, I'm from team eight. Okay, so team eight will get one point. Okay, so the next question, can I ask team two to choose a number? Choose number six. Okay, so number six, please. So, what is the factor indicating to what we do that affect an organization structure? Did I have mentioned in the chapter one and chapter five? Uh, in chapter one and chapter five, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Hoang Alejandran, please. Um, is that strategy? Yeah, you're correct. Okay, Alihan, can I ask you? You're from which team? Uh, team nine. Okay, team nine get one point. 
Okay, can I ask team number three to choose a number? Come on, you can get, you can be lucky enough to get the special present in this kitchen number. Um, number five. Number five, okay. So that is a question. This word contains two words. Which team consists of employees from various functional departments responsible to meet other team and solve multiple mutual problems? Oh, I see two mates raise your hand at the same time. So let me pick uh Nhi, please. Uh is it a cross functional team, I think. Yeah. You're totally correct. Okay, you are from which team? Can I ask you that? I'm from Team C. Okay, Team C yeah, gets thank one you. point. Okay, Team number five. Can I ask you to choose a number? Um, number 10. Okay. So this was a person who is responsible for coordinating the activity of several departments for the competition of a specific project. So it is easy. The answer can be that into the question. Okay, I see Min Yang raise her hand first. So Min Yang, please. Um, I think it's a project manager. Yeah, that is totally correct. Okay, Min Yang, can I ask you which team you are from? I'm from team two. Okay, team two get one point. Thank you. Okay, so team number six, can I ask you to choose a number? Uh, I think I will choose number seven. Okay, number seven, please. Seven is already chosen already. Oh. oh okay, so uh, uh, number nine. Number nine. Yeah, number please. nine. Okay, <laughs> so you have chose a lucky number. So you, we will send you a mystery gift if when we study offline. Okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> can 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 I ask you which team you're from? I'm from Team C. I'm from Team C. Yeah. Yeah, you are very lucky. So, Team 7, can I ask you to choose a number? Which number can we available? Uh, number f the number which has already been chosen is 5, 10, nine, 8. <laughs> Okay, so we choose uh, 11. Okay. S 
So, okay, Nguyễn Hạng. Please, um, it's span of management. Okay, that's totally correct. Guess you which team are you are you from? I'm from team three. Okay, to get one point. Okay, so the number which have already been chosen is five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven. You can choose the other number. Yes. So I will repeat the number which has already been chosen is five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, you can choose the Team other eight. number. You can choose your number. Uh, so we choose uh, number um, five. Yeah, five that has already been chosen. Mm, about what about thirteen? Yeah, yeah, thirteen is fine. We have should to have more level and narrow span. So the, in the second section after the 10, we said already mentioned by a link. Okay, I see Huynh Nhi is the one who raised her hand first. So Huynh Nhi, please. Uh, I think it's a tall structure. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Okay, team six, one point again. Okay, so team nine, can I ask you to choose a number? I've wrote, written down the number that had been chosen in the chat box. You can choose the other number. Can we get number one? Okay, number one. Strategy where activity are grouped together by common function from the bottom to the top of our organization is okay. Tung Le, please. Uh, so is that a functional structure? Yeah. Oh, you're correct. Excuse me, can I ask you what till you fall again? Uh, I'm in team eight. Okay. Thank you. So, so let's go to the IE number. So the last seven question I will give you to volunteer to answer this. So okay. Do anyone volunteer to answer the next question? Okay. Hi, Alihan Turan, please. Is that a work specialization? Yeah, work specialization, also known as divisive labor. That's totally correct. You are in Team 9, and I remember, yeah. right? Yeah. So, can anyone answer the question? Okay, three, two, run, please. 
is that a divisional approach? Yeah, right, right. You get one point. Okay. Can anyone compete with Alihan because he now had a high point? Okay, Huynh Nhi, please. Uh, strategic fit. All right. Yep, you are right. Okay, which is a theory team or committee decide to solve problem involving several department. Can anyone answer that? Yeah, remember the personnel that were deployed by the US government to provide supply for Philippines after the destructive storm in 2011. Okay, letting off my please. Yes, a task force. Is this a task force? Yeah, uh, yeah, team force is actually, but you are really correct. So I will give you a point with team you are in. Of my, can I ask you with team you're in, please? So next question, the highest level of horizontal coordination is okay. Okay, <laughs> why answer this? Okay. Chup time please. Uh relational coordination. Yeah, yeah, you're totally correct. So, which team you're in? A uh, seven. Okay. So, in conclusion, we have team six and team nine has the same point. Maybe we'll give, maybe Mr. Khoa can give both them, um, both those team member a participation mark. Can I ask you that, Mr. Khoa? Yes, uh, I think um, uh, uh, two team, uh, each member you have, has get a, a 0 0.5 mark for member of team. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Quai, and all of your cooperation. So that's the end of our presentation, and Jimmy has been rescued. If you have any difficulties according to our presentation, please ask. He is the free credit of the member who have contributed to the lesson today. We sincerely hope you have a great Black Friday and good luck on your path. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you for oh, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. And, uh, uh, and now for your last your turn, which uh, you can ask questions and uh, discuss about chapter 10. Any question? Uh, Sundar, you question. Um, I just want to ask that um, can we use two approaches um, into a company? Like, um, like the matrix approach and the virtual network approach in a company? Is that possible? So, first, I wonder the last who can answer the question of uh, Sunda uh, or 
you can uh, you can share your opinion, opinion your ideas and after that I will conduce um I will answer your question then it is possible like as mentioned once in the matrix approach that uh, the functional approach is pronounced at the top and and then we will operate the division approach to the low, in the lower levels so we can definitely operate multiple approaches in the organization that's my answer for your question oh thank you um i just ask one more question about this like um is there any real example of the organizations outside in the reality that um, implements uh, two approaches? Uh, I want to uh, ask Mr. Peter Kwa about this. Uh, you can uh, repeat your um, question. Uh, I want to. I want you to give uh, a real example. Yeah. Uh, of yeah. what? Of what? Of, uh, uh, the companies that are using multiple approaches yeah multiple approaches like uh they combine the matrix and virtual network approaches together mm. yeah or anything any any approaches yeah, yeah. okay i think um it's the main um uh, um in the in the uh, reply, uh, company usually uh, combine uh, many uh, kind of uh, structure in um, when they uh, um, operate. For example, uh, you can um, you can see as the uh, For example, it's the uh, US. Mm. Let's, uh, let me share my screen. For example, uh, in QH, um, first we uh, can use uh, some um, about the personal structure, and also we has the. Uh, oh. Wait a moment, we. Because uh, internet now is slow access. You can um, you can see the structure section of U8. Uh, so there's a uh, US council and boss management and. Uh, and there's uh, many uh, management department as we call the top top department and uh, slide department like uh, school on many school so uh, uh, in us may we can we can uh, see which um, department uh, management management uh, department us may they, they do with the uh, functional department yeah and also in U.S., we have some uh, uh, some divisional department. For example, uh, for example, uh, maybe uh, about the uh, ISB, ISB for example, ISB, uh, and uh, For example, ISP and uh, maybe about uh, the, some uh, program uh, 
cooperating program uh, CFPG and uh, Vietnam uh, and uh, Netherlands program for example that's about the uh, also that's about the project project management at the matches and um, and about the, the, the director program director program director uh, that's also the matches that's the, for example for me, uh, I am uh, Lee. I am uh, head the uh, head of um, strategic uh, division. But also, I am that's about the um, personal program, personal structure, and also I am also um, um, director of the management uh, program, and I'm a project manager of uh, the uh, program management program. So that's the matrix structure. So. For US, you can see US that you uh, connect, uh, they combine many kind of uh, um, structure in uh, as the US uh, uh, structure organization. It's there for you, Sunda. Yes, thank you, sir. Yeah. And uh, any question, any other question you can ask? and. Um, and uh, team uh, four, you can please uh, share your screen and I add some questions. Team four. Please share your, your slide. Yeah, really. Thank you. And uh, you uh, please go to your example about, uh, I remember, I remember, example about um, Apple, Apple, Apple and uh, KFC. Reverse line. Well, central central line and or the the central line. Central line. Central line. Yes, sir. You have a symbol about this uh, central line. Oh, I remember. Uh, what slide you uh, missing? Uh, you can you descend about this uh, KFC and uh, KFC and uh, KFC and um, Johnson and Johnson. You, you can go to the slide with uh, KFC and Johnson and Johnson for, for your example. Uh, do you want me to like talk go about to... it again or explain something? No, just go to the line and I, I you add question. Go to slide, that's line. And I just add question. No, I want. No, I want to go to the maybe my KFC. Okay, yet is the KFC. Yeah. Okay. This is so, um, I want to ask you to ask you question. That's why can you explain why why KFC KFC they choose uh, to uh, the, the way that uh, central line. Centralization, yeah. Oh, that's the power that is the located on the stock of the company. Why KFC they choose this model for for the structure? Can you explain why? Yes, Ngoc Mai, Yes, I think that's because they can quality control. 
the yes that's my opinion yeah thank you Good my Uh, thank so, you. Um, I want to answer your question. I yeah. think the capsule to the centralization structure because um, the small branch of capsule which um, doesn't need the employee that have um, high skill, high skill performance, and the centralization and the decentralization structure would allow the employee to coordinate themselves but the the branch of kfc which will provide food and follow order so i think they will refer the centralization structure thank you uh mr long uh, you asked uh, uh correct you and um, long and uh, my you're correct that's um you you see um uh, which uh, kfc the business model is a uh, franchise. So franchise, they must have um, um, <coughs> must uh, has many, there's many um, um, uh, side, many uh, veteran or when of a KFC, but they has the same, the, the same design, the same quality and the same uh, uh, service so uh, to to make uh, the uh, they to uh, to control the same on on the same uh, ten standards of uh, KFC they must uh, the decision must uh, must make on the top of the company they to control all the branch and the branch of the KFC so they must do the, the model of uh, centralization. First, uh, for Johnson and Johnson. Johnson, Johnson, yeah. Why Johnson, they, uh, they choose the decentralization model? Who can explain why? Can I explain it? Yeah. So I think Johnson and Johnson do the decentralization first. Um, like, uh, they have many small companies, and because uh, these small companies are located everywhere, like, it is work. It is Johnson and Johnson is a worldwide company, so use decentralization will have the company to like they will understand the local customer better because they will place in that locate location and like if one company make a mistake it don't like uh, cripple the whole organization yeah thank you miss ling and uh, sunda can you uh, I just want to add some extra information because yeah. um, Johnson & Johnson um, in, in their field, uh, it requires um, the flexibility. Yeah, so um, this decentralization may be uh, more flexible for them to deliver their products to customers and yeah, to and they work with a variable of uh, products. There are many kinds of products. So they will choose the decentralization. Yeah, yeah. thank you, uh, Sunda. That's, that's uh, you, Ling and Sunda. You are correct. That's um, because uh, Johnson Johnson, they charge it they to, uh, they to, uh, to change, make a change quickly to adapt with the, the trend of uh, customer needs. So they must uh, must uh, use the centralization for so that and uh, um, so they they branch in uh, in a different country or uh, different uh, markets different location they can uh, flexible to adapt with the customer at with the location. 
Okay, and uh, and there's uh, you you can uh, you can see from the file uh, file of um, the structure. Uh, first, uh, personal personal structure. The second, uh, divisional structure and a matrix structure, uh, structure and uh, team and uh, network approach. So you you can see you can see um, at first the the power is the the uh, locate on the top, but uh, from uh, divisional structure the power they degrade um, lower, and uh, for uh, matrix the power delegates to the uh, project manager and uh, um, the team power uh, delegate to the team team leader on the team on the team and also also for network uh, approach the, uh, the the decision um, maker can outside the company so you see is there the the trend the trend of the uh, of uh, uh, structure organization structure today, they they they, uh, they, they let, uh, the power lower and also outside the company. And also that's the uh, characteristic of um, no structure. That's when you delegate the power to from the top to the bottom. So the uh, the structure may be more, more flexible, more like, more flexible. So uh, the company they can easy to adapt with the, uh, the changing of uh, the markets and environment. That's um, uh, so you see today why so many company use the team structure and uh, network approach to uh, so they can is then they can help company to uh, they can uh, less uh, flexible to adapt with uh, the, the trend, the quickly changing, changing quickly of the market environment. So I I can do um, emphasize you uh, some uh, the trend um, of the uh, structure organizational structure today. So any other question? Okay, I uh, thank you for Team Paul for your very uh, carefully um, preparation and uh, your interesting um, presentation. And so we uh, will uh, take a rest uh, about 15 minutes. We, we will wait uh, with uh, 3 p.m. So uh, in this time, uh, team five, uh, prepare for your, uh, you prepare for your presentation.